In October of 1942, in Canada and in the United States, much of the public attention was focused on the war overseas. In the midst of the turmoil, the National Hockey League began its 26th season, ushering in a period of what turned out to be a stretch of remarkable stability. For the next 25 years, the league was built on the back of, and consisted of, just six teams. You had two teams in Canada. You had the Canadians and you had the Toronto Maple Leafs. And then you had the Rangers and the Blackhawks and the Bruins and the Red Wings in the United States. You had 120 guys playing in the National Hockey League at that time. During the NHL's golden age, there was a real sense of familiarity, a meaningful and emotional bond between team and community, and the players they grew accustomed to rooting for. But even for the great ones, with so few jobs during the original Six era, among the players, there was an undeniable tension. These guys played with injuries. Elmer Locke once had his foot slashed by an opponent's skate, and it slashed through the leather boot, and he's sitting on the bench, and a teammate looks down and sees the blood pooling at his feet, and he says, Elmer, what's wrong with your foot? And Elmer looks down, and he says, oh, it's nothing serious. Well, it was two severed veins, and Elmer's playing hockey on this. It was always the thought that if you were taken out for a game and the guy who replaced you played well, it would take something pretty miraculous for you to get back into the lineup. It was uh, rough and tumble hockey. You had to be uh, rugged to play in the NHL in the old days. The rivalries were intense. You played each team 14 times. And there was no friends on the ice. They were all enemies. That meant cutting you to win, I'd cut you to win. They couldn't literally breathe each other's air. And John Ferguson once was sitting in a restaurant in Toronto up the road from Maple Leaf Gardens with a teammate. He had ordered a steak, and Eddie Shack walked in, walked to the back of the restaurant. Fergie threw a bunch of money on the table, and he said to his teammate, let's go. And the teammate said, well, the food hasn't arrived. He said, if you think I'm going to sit and eat in the same restaurant as Eddie Shack, you're dreaming. In just about every way, both on and off the ice, the NHL of the 1940s and 50s was decidedly different than it is today. One of the more striking was the way teams traveled between cities, on trains, where avoiding the enemy was nearly impossible. You wouldn't go in to eat when they went in, or they wouldn't go in to eat when you went in, because we were enemies. I've heard stories from some of the old timers who would talk about stumbling into the dining car when they thought it was their time and the other team was still in there, and dishes being thrown and punches being thrown and insults being exchanged. These teams would be gone for two weeks, and you can't help but become close to your teammates. They would go to the smoking car together. They would play uh, a lot of card games. Those lengthy trips, like Montreal to Chicago, were overnight, and that meant a distinct player protocol for sleeping. Rookies on top, vets on the bottom. For some, it was difficult. For others, just part of the charm. I never slept well on the trains. Because of my length, I just uh, never got comfortable in the bursts. They were way too short for me. Going to Chicago, I can almost remember every clickety-click. Tickety-click, tickety-click, clickety-click, clickety-click. It was just a way of life. On the long trips out to the East Coast, we used to love to go to the club car. And they had crispy tablecloths and napkins and sit there and have a New York steak medium rare, and watch the world go by. That's what I miss most, were the road trips. The camaraderie of the guys, all for one, one for all, trying to make the playoffs and, and win that old chalice, the Stanley Cup. Much of the NHL's heart and soul could be found during the original Six era. 
including three of the NHL's greatest dynasties and many of its more memorable and recognizable stars. Most notably, Gordy Howe, who had such a tremendous impact on the professional game, they called him Mr. Hockey. Gordy's always been a force of nature. He was just one strong kid. Ab Howe, his father, would show off Gordy's uh, strength by saying, Gordy, go lift up those five bags of 95-pound cement. And Gordy could actually lift all five bags, dog-eared like that, and swing them and throw them onto the back of a truck. Gordy Howe was the best hockey player I ever saw. He was the only ambidextrous superstar. Imagine, he could shoot from the left, he could shoot from the right. Who else does things like that? Howe gets over the line, he's cutting in, he gets set, a backhand, he scores! Gordy Howe! Gordy could do everything. He had this great edge to him. He could be as physical and as hard-hitting and as nasty as you wanted, but he had such a great nose for the net. He was not only very skilled, but he was as tough as anybody's ever been in the NHL. Gordie Howe played his first NHL game in October of 1946. And for the rest of the original six era, and even beyond, he was the face of the league. Beginning in 1950, as the centerpiece of the famed production line, with Sid Abel and Ted Lindsay, Howe led the NHL in scoring four consecutive years, twice in both goals and assists. He was the offensive engine of a Red Wings team that also featured two other all-time greats, goaltender Terry Sawchuk. But once again, Terry Sawchuk is too good. And defenseman Red Kelly. When I got the puck, I was offensive. To Red Kelly, who drives in a screenshot. You have to have goal scorers, you have to have checkers, you have to have some diggers who will dig that puck out of the corner. It's not one player, it's a team. Sawchuk is mobbed by his jubilant teammates. The Red Wings won four Stanley Cups in the first half of the decade, including back-to-back -back in 1954 and 1955. At the time, a period of unprecedented dominance for the NHL's marquee team. For the National Hockey League, the back half of the 1950s saw the emergence of another legendary dynasty, led by another legendary star. The first player in the league to score 50 goals in one season, Maurice Rocket Richard. Goalies have said that his eyes looked like lights flashing on a pinball machine, and he literally skated to the net carrying a defenseman on his back. And there's Rocket goal number three. As much of a hero as he was as a hockey player, there very much was this political undercurrent in the province of Quebec as you turn from the 1940s into the 1950s. The French Canadians right in Quebec, even though they are the French-speaking province, often felt oppressed. Aldo Montreal is majority French. People didn't feel they were in majority. St. Catherine Street at the time, all the signs were in English. All the business was in English. Rocket Richard was more than a hockey player for citizens of, of Quebec. Over the years, he became an icon, a symbol. Richard's fame was such that nearly two decades after he played, he still was the centerpiece of Rock Carrier's iconic piece of Canadian literature the children's book, The Hockey Sweater, which was also made into an animated film. We all wore the same costume as Maurice Richard did. My mom said, rock your sweater, there's holes there, people will think that we are poor. So I will order a new sweater. So we received the hockey sweater, and it was not the sweater of the Montreal Canadiens. It was the sweater of the Toronto Maple Leaf. The enemy. I can't wear that. Maurice Richard would never wear it.
Fortunately for the book's little hero, 1,000 moths appear, eat his sweater, and end his misery. And while the book brilliantly captured the cultural tensions between English and French-speaking Canada, there was an incident with Maurice Richard in 1955 that was far more violent. It all began when Rocket engaged in an altercation with the Boston Bruins and knocked a linesman unconscious. NHL President Clarence Campbell suspended Richard for the rest of the season and the Stanley Cup playoffs. And when Campbell showed up for a game at the Forum, Montreal fans, upset with the treatment of their star player, spilled their anger as well as some blood. They didn't suspend a hockey player. They suspended God. And a guy comes up on the premise of shaking hands with Mr. Campbell, in fact, punches him. All of a sudden, Campbell's bombarded with tomatoes and other debris. And then a smoke bomb goes off. A tear gas bomb was thrown, and fans went on a rampage. We get into our dressing room, and all of a sudden, our doctor comes running in. He said they've thrown tear gas, and he's kind of wiping his eyes. We undo our skates, and we don't know what's going to happen. The next thing we know, they've rioted, they've set fire to new stands on St. Catharines. And fans destroyed uh, thousands of dollars worth of property and just pretty much made a mess of the city of Montreal. It was hockey inspired, but it, it became much more than that. And that's another reflection of the way that hockey, almost a, a literal expression of the way that hockey spills out of the, of the rink into, the, into life. Richard was so frustrated with the suspension, he even contemplated retirement. He did reconsider and eventually returned, vowing to lead to glory, but was fast becoming the NHL's most talented team. It was just a joy to watch uh, those guys skate and move that puck. And that Doug Harvey would just lay that puck right on their stick, wherever it was, there, there, up the center. He was magnificent. And then you move up front and you have a guy like Jean Beliveau. If Maurice Richard was the furnace in the belly of the Montreal Canadiens, I would say that Jean Beliveau was the conscience. For five consecutive seasons, Ending in 1960, Les Canadiens were the only team to hoist the Stanley Cup, a feat no other NHL team had ever accomplished. And they did it with pretty much the same lineup each year. Beliveau, Harvey, Dickie Moore, Boom Boom Jaffrion, Jacques Plante the goalie, Maurice Richard and his younger brother Henri were among the 12 players who played on all five cup-winning teams. For most of the original six era, NHL hockey looked pretty much the same. Same six teams, playing in the same six arenas. Madison Square Garden in New York, the Forum in Montreal, Detroit's Olympia, the Boston Garden, Chicago Stadium, and Maple Leaf Gardens. But over those same 25 years, there were several notable innovations that had a major impact on the game. The red line was introduced in 1943, which helped speed up play. Three years later, Maple Leaf Gardens installed plexiglass, which improved the fan experience. And eight years after that, in 1954, the Zamboni was first used, and poor ice conditions around the league would soon improve dramatically. Player equipment changed quite a bit too. In 1947, Emile the Cat Francis made goaltending a bit easier by using a new, larger catching glove. Although that upgrade did little to make the NHL's most dangerous position any safer. I'm just in awe of the punishment that those guys took from pucks and uh, crashing players and skates flying at them. The equipment they were wearing didn't provide a lot of protection, especially the fact that they weren't wearing masks. It was a mark of, of honor, really, how many stitches you'd had through your career. I had 45 stitches here. 
for the skate, and that was the time they didn't have these white tips behind the skate. I knew that I was going to get some scars sooner or later. I knew I was going to lose my, my teeth, and I did lose them all. Glenn Hall liked to shave before a game, and everybody said, why would you shave? He said, well, when they're putting stitches in, it's a whole lot easier and cleaner when I'm clean shaven. While most hockey players in the 1950s considered a stitched up face to be a badge of honor, there was a sense of cruel and unusual punishment when it came to the men in the net. And in 1959, Jacques Plante finally did something about it. Andy Bathgate was mad at Plant, and he came in and flipped the puck right up into his face, no mask. Plant had been experimenting with a mask. He went off to get repaired, and his nose was a bloody mess. Plant got stitched up, and he said, I'm only going back into the net if I can wear my mask. He took off on a winning streak after that, and that cemented his ability to wear the mask in NHL games. Things do move very quickly after that, but there's a lot of resistance. I mean, guys in the NHL aren't wearing masks 10 years after that still. Even in 1974, Andy Brown of the Pittsburgh Penguins was still not wearing a mask. Uh, and so by this point in the league, you already had players like Bobby Hall who had perfected the slap shot. He was shooting his slap shot at 118 miles per hour. So you're taking your life in your own hands at the other end of a Bobby Hall slap shot. When I started something, I wanted to perfect it. I got so I could slap that puck pretty good. His teammate, Stan Makita, had a stick that had been broken partway on the blade, and he just took some shots in practice and realized it did all kinds of things when he slapped it. It dipsy doodled and up and down, and well, all of a sudden, you know, the light bulb went over their heads, and they're soaking it in hot water and then putting it under door frames so they can curve the stick. But changed the game substantially. Then, after revolutionizing the game, the NHL came to us. OK, we want you to get three sticks ready, and we're going to come and check them to see that they're not too much hooked. Well, they might just as well have pounded sand, because as soon as their back was turned, I got the torch out, and I was hooked by the way I wanted it. <laughs> it was, however, hardly surprising that some other, more important changes were slow to come to the league. It wasn't until 1958 that the NHL saw its first black player, Willie O'Ree of the Boston Bruins. And when it came to contracts, original six owners had the players just where they wanted them. The owners of each of the six teams were paying their players a pittance for all intents and purposes. Hey, if you don't like it, the American Hockey League, the Western Hockey League are there. We'll send you there again and you'll be so far gone the hockey news won't be able to find you. Every year was a battle for your salary. They would go in and sit down, and the contract would be shoved across to them to look at. And it would be the very same one they had the year before, and the same one as the year before that. Eventually, a few high-profile players decided something had to be done. In 1957, Ted Lindsay of the Detroit Red Wings was one of them, risking his career in an attempt to start an NHL Players Association. We weren't looking to run the game, but I do the same thing today because I believed in what I was doing. I wasn't doing it to agitate owners. I was doing it for the players. Although some progress was made, it would be another 10 years before the NHL would have an official Players Association. While Lindsay himself, despite being a nine-time All-Star and captain of the Detroit Red Wings, was unceremoniously traded to the Chicago Blackhawks. He left in 1960, a year before the Hawks, with Bobby Hull, Stan Makita, and goalie Glenn Hall won the 1961 Stanley Cup. It was, in fact, the only time in the original six era that a team other than the Montreal Canadiens, Detroit Red Wings, or Toronto Maple Leafs would win the cup. The Leafs bookended the era's 25 years, winning the cup six times from 1942 to 1951, the NHL's first real dynasty. But after that, it would be another decade before Toronto would challenge for the cup again. This time, led by young stars Dave Keon and Frank Mahovlich, as well as veterans Red Kelly 
and the ageless wonder in goal, Johnny Bauer, who had spent most of his first 14 professional seasons in the minors before finally finding his form in Toronto. Bauer made a sensational save, covering up on the shot. My childhood dream, I wanted to play in the National Hockey League. I wanted to have my name engraved on the Stanley Cup. The Leafs players come pouring over the board to congratulate one another. And my dream came finally true. Bauer first saw his name engraved in 1962, and then again in 1963 and 64. Although that year is best remembered for another Leafs act of remarkable courage. Trailing the Red Wings three games to two, defenseman Bob Bond had to leave the ice on a stretcher after blocking a shot late in game six. They're lifting Bond up there on that stretcher. Well, his pain threshold was very high. He played with injuries that, that uh, normal people wouldn't, wouldn't have played. Bond somehow returned to score the overtime goal. He comes back to Bob Bond, he shoots, he scores! Bob Bond shot. Then helped the Leafs win game seven. And the Toronto Maple Leafs win the Stanley Cup. As it turned out, on a broken ankle. After Toronto's run in the mid-60s, the Cup twice went back to Montreal. And by 1967, most of Toronto's veteran team was thought to be too far down the line to challenge the mighty Canadiens for another Stanley Cup. No one that year expects the Toronto Maple Leafs to win, including in Toronto. Great players, but for the most part, they are on the very back end of their career. Everybody sort of thought this was the Over the Hill Gang. Over the Hill Gang, but Over the Hill Gang knew how to win. Despite an average age of more than 40, Toronto's goaltending tandem of Johnny Bauer and Terry Sawchuk led the Leafs to a surprising victory. It's all over. The Toronto Maple Leafs have won the Stanley Cup. That's what it's all about. You grew up as a kid, you wanted to play in the National Hockey League. Then you want to win the Stanley Cup. And after you've won one, then you want to win another one. Then you want to win another one. That's what I loved. <laughs> That's what I loved the most. That cup, Toronto's 13th, would be the last of the original six era. Just six months later, the NHL would double in size. And nothing about the league would ever look the same again.